Okay, so we're now recording. Hello, my name is Sam Harlow. I'm the UNCG University Libraries Online Learning Librarian, as well as the Liaison to Kinesiology, Public Health Education, and Community and Therapeutic Recreation. So uh, I think years ago now, about two years ago now, UNCG Libraries came up with the idea to create a series of webinars for the UNCG community on research and applications. So welcome to this uh, webinar series. In this series, different librarians will cover topics on UNCG libraries resources and research tools, such as databases. Uh, these 30 minute webinars are recorded in WebEx meetings where we are now and placed on the library webpage through YouTube, which is what we use to close caption the webinars. So they will be on this page here that I'm dropping into the chat. And hey, um, Duke Endowment Center, I'm gonna mute you if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Thanks. So um, I'm going to cover a couple of logistical things about how this webinar is going to run. Please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red, but feel free to turn your audio back on at the end of the webinar to participate in the conversation with the presenter. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in the chat. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put them in the chat. I will track the questions there while Megan presents the materials. If there's any technical issues, you're welcome to email me um, at this email that I'm dropping into the chat as well. But please remember that this is being recorded. Um, so uh, don't worry about uh, that if it's that's the worst case scenario. So let me know if you have any questions in the chat. Um, again, I've been muting people as they've been coming in, um, but use the chat to ask questions if you have any questions about logistics. So today, this session is being hosted by our UNCG Library Science Liaison Librarian, Megan Carlton, and she will be presenting on Scopus, which she'll talk about what that is. So Megan, you can get started. Okay, well, hi, I'm Megan. And um, so this is, it's kind of hard to limit Scopus to just 30 minutes. So this is just gonna be a very general overview. Um, and feel free to, again, like keep some notes about things that you want me to expand on or that you can email me later and ask more questions about. Um, I am gonna turn my video off though, cause it'll make me paranoid. Um, so what is a Scopus? So technically um, it's a citation and abstracting database and it has you know, thousands of articles, literature, books, conference proceedings um, on a wide range of topics. So it's kind of easier to understand how Scopus is different if we look at two products that are from the same company. So Elsevier owns both Scopus and ScienceDirect. And ScienceDirect, like many of the databases you may be familiar with, um, host the full text of Elsevier content. So the journals um, that are published or owned by Elsevier, the full text will be hosted on ScienceDirect. But Scopus includes content from Elsevier and many, many other publishers. And so compiling all of this content from this many publishers is kind of why um, Scopus will provide a lot more results than other databases will. Um, so their content, as you know, life sciences, social sciences, physical and health sciences. And they have a breakdown um, that you can go and look at and to, to see um, if the content that you're interested in is, is covered by Scopus. And if so, kind of how much, because this is not a good database if you're looking for uh, papers on history because they don't really cover that at all. Okay, so now I'm going to walk you through um, just some simple searches. Um, there's four main types of searches that they have, and we'll start with a document search. Um, and since this is very similar to other ones, I won't spend too much time on it, but the one thing that uh, is good to know about Scopus is their, their search roles, and you can look at their, their search tips on this little question mark. Um, the main thing, so when you're looking for exact phrases or words, their, their big difference that they have is that they use um, curly brackets if you're looking for very specific um, exact words, I'm sorry. Um, so quotation marks are used in a lot of databases and this one's a little bit different in that they use the curly brackets. 
Um, but I do, I do still like to use quote the uh, double quotes because they will give you um, a kind of a loose phrase search. I'm going to look for data literacy and you can use this uh, drop down menu on the search to if you want to limit it to just the article title or just look in the abstract, things like that, you can they have a lot more options when it comes to um, where it's performing the search than a lot of other databases do. The one feature that I really, really like is if you're doing your search and it's not coming up with a lot of things that are relevant, you can just go ahead and add another search term to your search without having to go back and change it. So for this one, I'm just going to add library and we can add that to our search and it'll drop down the number of documents that it receives or that it brought back. Um, so everything in Scopus is really user friendly as far as um, things being clickable and uh, to be able to kind of sort through your results. Um, the check boxes over here are really easy. You can go through all of their filters and click um, any results that you want to either limit or exclude from your results. And then if you're unsure if you want to exclude it and you want a preview of what it contains, you can click on these arrows and it will give you a preview of what that will either limit it to or exclude from your search. And again, these are all clickable so you could go in and look at exactly what this document is. Another thing that I really like about um, Scopus is the document types, because a lot of the students that I work with, they're either trying to exclude reviews from their searches or they're looking for these secondary um, review articles. So this is a good way to either you know, exclude those book chapters or to just search for those specifically. So another thing to note, and I've, I've changed it a little bit, it's, it's normally um, the results are sorted by uh, the newest date, but you can also sort by the citedness and the relevance authors and the source title. Um, the relevance is a term that can cause some confusion in any database that you're in. Um, you know, if you say that I found some really relevant papers in Scopus, it means that we found articles that match the idea that we had in our minds when we started searching. Um, and so this uh, to people is kind of subjective, but search engine relevance on the other hand is very um, calculated. So they use, you know, um, oh my gosh, logarithms and stuff to calculate documents that they can say match the criteria executed in your search query. Um, so my favorite thing to sort by is um, the highest cited articles. And the reason I like to do this is because I want to make sure I have the, those most influential papers in my field. And again, everything is clickable. So if you wanted to see who cited these documents, you can click on that number and it'll bring up that list of here 54 documents that cited this one. So from before we leave this results page, um, some interesting features that they've added is the secondary documents. So a secondary document for them is one that has kind of has been extracted from a reference list within one of their indexed papers. So this might not be available directly within Scopus, but you'll still be able to find it from um, those references. They've also recently added patents to the search. And so well, for this topic, there's not a lot. There's only three. Um, but depending on your search, there might be a lot of patents associated with that search as well. So when you go to the item record for the document, the main thing that people are usually interested in is how do I get to this article? Um, and there's this find full text button at the top of every um, item record. And since they don't host the articles within the database, it's going to take you to the library's website to try to find that article and then send you to the appropriate database from there. So it may be a lot of clicking to actually find the article that you're looking for. So you can also, from here, again, see what documents have cited this article. 
And then at the bottom, you can see their reference list, which I really like because you can look, you know, if you're looking at these secondary documents, um, you can click on these results and you can put them in a, in a results page format. And then you can sort these or see um, the authors and where everything um, was published as well as who cited those documents. So from this item page, as you can see, there's a ton of information. I'm not going to talk about each piece, but if you see something um, that sparks your interest, just put it in the chat and I can talk about it. But um, another thing that you'll, that might be of interest is the metrics. So PlumX metrics is very similar to alt metrics. They show you um, how the community is kind of engaged with the article. So then if you go to this uh, view all metrics, it'll show you the, um, the impact of that paper through site score. Is this one site score? I'm sorry. They have so many different references uh, or citation metrics that remembering which ones are called which um, can be a little difficult sometimes. Um, so this one, Right, we'll sh show you how many times the article's been cited, um, and it'll show you by date the citations. But then it also kind of shows you how it compares to similar documents, and that's how this uh, field-weighted citation impact is, and the citation benchmark. It will kind of compare how um, citations in that field generally um, generally go, and then compare this article to that. Okay, so let's go back to our original search. So another thing that I really like um, is this analyze search results, and it can help you kind of get an overview of the topic that you're looking at. And as you can see, our term data literacy wasn't really used in um, as a term in research until more recently. You know, all, Although that's interesting, I think it's more helpful to kind of look at the documents by subject area. Since there's so many uh, multidisciplinary fields, it can be useful to kind of track, you know, where there might be gaps in the literature um, for, or for you to specify your search. So, you know, you can see how data literacy is talked about within mathematics or business or other subjects. Also might be interested if you're a grad student to kind of see where, uh, what institutions are, are researching this topic. So you can look at the documents by affiliation. And again, all of these are clickable where you could go in and see um, what those documents are that it's referring to. And then you can also look at the documents by the funding sponsor. And this can be a good way to find um, you know, what, what sponsors are more likely to support various topics, um, whether it's NSF or um, a smaller sponsor that you might not have heard of before. This can be a good way to kind of find some of those. So if we go back to our main page, I'm going to show you just a quick author search. So you can put in um, either the name or the affiliation or the person. The ORCID ID is going to be the best way um, for you to find the specific person you're looking for. You know, it's like an ISBN for people, so it will distinguish you from different authors. And if anybody ever needed help setting one of those up, um, I will definitely uh, be happy to show you. So when we do our search, if there's multiple authors that have the same name, if you know that that author is the same person, you can use the checkboxes to click on however many authors you want and then see the documents from all of those. Or you can just click on the author that you want to look at. So from here, you'll see, again, a lot of information about, you know, not only the documents that the author's written, but their citations and any co-authors that they've worked with. Um, this, main, this main 
page graph right here is going to show you the documents and citations from year or by year. And if you click on this view H graph, it's going to give you information about the author's H index. So the H index is an author level metric that attempts to measure both their um, productivity and the citation impact of the publications um, for that author. So the index is based on a set of the scientists most, ci most cited papers and then the number of citations that they have received on other publications. Oh, so uh, also I really like seeing the, the co-authors. Um, so you can see who this person likes to publish with the most. And again, this is all clickable. You can click on either the person or go in and see the documents that they've published together. Now we'll go into our affiliation search. So from here you can see um, how many documents that, well, by subject is the, the main breakdown that they have, that a university has published, and then who's published them. Um, so you can look at, you can either go into specific topics to see you know, who the authors are in that topic, or, or subject, I'm sorry, or you can just click on the authors and see all of the authors um, from this university and their publications. Um, another, another helpful button is the collaborating affiliations. So you can see that UNCG really likes to work with North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and you can go through again and click on those documents and look at the specifics for those. So the main thing, and I wanted to make sure and leave enough time is the compare sources button. So this is a great, um, great feature for grad students or faculty or anybody looking on where they might want to publish a paper um, and which journal they should choose. So it's over here on the right, kind of out of the way and um, easy to miss sometimes. Oh, and of course it kept my my previous search, which is great. Um, but you can search uh, for any journal that's indexed within Scopus. So this one I was looking at librarianship. And it'll pull up um, any of them with that name in the title. And you can just click on it and add, you can add up to 10 different sources um, to compare against each other. and. Uh, so this first one, the site score is going to calculate the average number of citations um, received in a calendar year by all the items published in that journal in the preceding three years. So these, and again, this is, I tell you, there's a lot of different metrics in Scopus. Um, here's a, the bulk of them is when you start looking at the actual journals. Um, and each one is going to tell you different things, like the um, is the Shimago journal ranking, and it compares the scientific prestige of each source based on weighted citations per document. Um, and so for each of these, if you're unsure about what that metric is and how they're calculating it, there's a little question mark next to each one that will tell you um, how they arrive to that score. Oh, and then another one that can be useful is the uh, SNP score, and it's a source normalized impact per paper. And this compares um, the citation impact of sources in different subject fields. Um, so it uses just that average citation count per paper and then the potential of what the citation count could be in that field. Again, these are can be very overwhelming, but it can kind of help you when you're just looking um, at a very broad overview of which paper might be ranked a little higher and have a little more impact. Um, for this one, I would.
try to, I would shoot for and try to choose um, the one that's at the top of every graph, um, if that's what you're going for. Um, but I may have gone super fast. And so if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them or talk a little more about um, certain features that there are. Hey, Megan. Um asked a question uh, pretty early on about is the library paying for access to Scopus? Do we just go through www.scopus.com? Do we log in with our single sign on UNCG credentials? Our preference is able to be set for our individual login. And lastly, will the search result fill in the Iliad search form if a journal article needs to be requested through interlibrary loan? And uh, I did follow up and I gave before that and after I gave them the permalink to it, but I said you were going to cover how to get there from the library homepage. Right. So from the library homepage, uh, you will have to use our proxy link to get in because this is a, a service that we're paying for. Um, so from the library's webpage, and there's several links to it on all of the libguides, depending on what um, subject area you're sorry, what your major is or what area you teach in. But if you just go to the databases and on S, you can get to Scopus from there. And it will ask you to sign on um, with yeah, your Spartan login, your single sign, whatever it's called. Yes, your UNCG credentials. Um, and then it actually, it will ask you pretty frequently to log back in. So when I'm at home and I, let my computer go to sleep or whatever. When I pull it back up, it'll ask me to sign in again. Um, so you can set up preferences. Here it has um, a way to log in and create a Scopus user ID. And when you set this up, that's you can um, set up alerts and different things like that. I actually have not set up a a personalized account with them, but it is something that you can do and you can take advantage of a lot of um, other features if you sign up, um, create an account with them. And then, let's see, will the search, what was the last search result? Oh, so yes, if you, let's see, back in the documents, if you, was a good example. Oh, so this one, we did not have the full text for this article. So it will go ahead and pre-fill everything for you because when you click on that find full text, it'll take you to the library's website and search for that article. So since we don't have this one, you can request the interlibrary loan and it'll fill everything out for you. Did that answer all of your questions? That's the only question right now. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please put it in the chat. Did you have anything else to cover, Megan? Uh, hmm. Um, I mean, I could always talk about more things. <laughs> so um, there's there's a lot of extra information within Scopus, like this uh, this SciVal prominence. You'll see on almost all articles, but this is a paid for service that we don't subscribe to, and it kind of talks about um, about that topic in relation to um, how popular that term is getting. So if you go to that analyze search results, you can kind of look at that same information there, but like this, uh, the SciVal we don't subscribe to. And again, it's another another metric they're trying to make important, um, I guess. But also on this main page, it's, it's great that you can see the funding uh, details right on the items page. Um, and also, I'm trying to think, like, what what else is of interest or there's nothing else, or if you think of a question later, you're welcome to there, email me. There's one more question right now. If you set up a, sorry. Oh, 
Awesome. If you set up a personal Scopus account, can you set up UNCG as a preferred library and log on without going through the UNCG library website? Actually, I'm not sure. I haven't tried it. I will try it. And um, I'm assuming you probably will too. <laughs> um, I think not. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but um, the scope, the sign in accounts are separate than our proxies. So, yeah, if you're off campus, you always have to go through those proxies. Sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad you, you know. <laughs> um, as if other people are thinking about questions, um, too, uh, we still have four more minutes. Um, I will put in uh, a plug for um, other webinars. So um, yeah, Michelle said, I was wondering if it worked a little like Google Scholar. Yeah, um, yes. though there are similarities, no, like the databases like that that we pay money for, yeah, work on a separate system. So this is actually the last part of the series for uh, our research and application series. If you're interested or missed any of the others we did this uh, this semester or in years past, uh, be sure to check out that page. Uh, this semester we have done one on researcher identity management, policy map, journals, the good, the bad, and the ugly, talking about predatory journals, and of course today, Scopus. Um, so we also have one coming up for our online learning, or two coming up for our online learning and innovation. A series, one on Canvas and analytics, and the last one on tips for lecture and web capture. Uh, so that is the other series we do through UNCG. So um, does anyone else have any questions for um, Megan? Yeah, Dal says thanks. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, Megan, do you have any final words before I shut the meeting down? Just again, if you have a very general overview and if you have any um, more advanced questions, I'd be happy to help. Yeah, Megan, do you want to put your email in the chat? Oh, yeah. Because um, Megan is our definitely our Scopus expert. There it is. Megan Carlton at uncg.edu. Great. I love the easy ones. <laughs> Okay, well, great. Thank you all for coming. Um, you will get an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recording if you want to share it out with other instructors or faculty. Um, and uh, we will see you all soon. Have a great week. Bye.